so Aaron, let's go. Let's go to the um, the next slide. Um, the um, in the WRLC project plan for 2021, and this year we we did something a little different uh, as far as initiatives go for the year, and we called it a project plan, and we had uh, these sort of smaller um, uh, projects identified. One of them was to investigate and pilot a custom request form that could replace the various uh, resource sharing, digitization, hold, ILL requests, and so forth. Um, this, this project was assigned to the Alma uh, Primo Advisory Committee, who created um, this tiger team, let's call it, that you see listed here uh, to, to um, do this investigation. Um, I'm not going to name all of the people. You can see them there, um, but it was um, a uh, a mix of, of people that are at the WRLC headquarters, as well as uh, some uh, folks from some of the IZs. Um, and so this team uh, is uh, welcoming this opportunity to describe our progress and to get feedback from you all on on what. Uh, we would recommend uh, going forward, and in particular for uh, the next project plan or initiatives that come uh, for uh, 2022. Um, as background, uh, you know, I think we've struggled since going live in Primo in 2018 with configuring the Primo display to make requesting uh, of physical items as well as um, article and chapter scans simpler for users. We've made some improvements as we learned um, you know, about display logic rules and, and uh, a couple of cases we're able to use Primo user interface customizations. But these um, improvements were really just patchwork. Um, they're not completely solving the problem in, in any way, uh, far from completely uh, solving the problems. And, and they're sort of fragile in that, um, you know, they depend on each other and if something changes, then something else um, can easily break. Um, we've come to the conclusion, I think that there's, there's sort of fundamental architectural issues um, with the Alma platform, such as uh, the separate mechanisms that they have for these uh, direct hold requests versus our consortial requests and the inability uh, of the platform Form to calculate availability across the network in anything close to, to real time for the user. Uh, and really, these, things, these problems make um, configuring a single request form like we had with uh, the CLS system in Voyager uh, pretty much impossible. And we've also had several conversations with um, Ex Libris at, at some high technical and product management levels. And it does not appear that they are, will be addressing these issues with the, these fundamental architectural issues with the platform in um, the foreseeable future. Um, the, the SCF re-architecture project has also uh, sort of exposed and uncovered these problems. And in some cases, um, such as with uh, periodicals, um, made the, um, the issues worse. Uh, with uh, fulfillments now occurring in the owning library IZ for items that are stored in the SCF. And so users can't really see in Primo a combined list of those um, shared periodical holdings. Um, the, the actual, um, I think the, 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 when people, when users request, requesting a physical volume of a, um, of a periodical is, is a fairly rare occurrence, um, but it is a particularly difficult one with the configurations that we have available. And it also presents, uh, we think most of the issues that need to be explored in order to move towards a, a custom form that could handle all types of requests. So we decided to focus on that use case for this uh, initial investigation. And uh, Dulce is now going to describe this use case that is the print periodicals challenge in uh, some more detail. Thank you, Don. Okay, so um, 
this is uh, an example of a case where a user might want to request the whole volume of a, of a journal as opposed to uh, requesting a single article. Um, so this is uh, this example is uh, Grant a magazine, which is a literary magazine. Um, in in our case, uh, GW, I think most of these are uh, most of our holdings are in the shared storage facility, um, shared collection facility. Um, and so let's for this hypothetical test case, a user wants to read um, Grant his first issue that was devoted to emerging British novelists. They they've done a few of these over the years. Um, and they're, you know, considered uh, somewhat significant in terms of, um, you know, significant moments in uh, current contemporary literary history, I guess you could say. Um, so th the user knows that they want to look at, they want to look at volume 19, issue number seven from 1983, um, and they want to see the whole volume because th th it's important in this context to look at the whole volume, not just a single article. Um, so we could go to the... Next slide, please. So there are um, really three different kinds of, if we, ex if we exclude the idea of digitization requests, which we're not really talking about today, um, there are three potential routes for a user um, to request this when they can't just go to the stacks um, and get it, them, get it themselves. Um, and for a GW at least, that's the case with almost all of our periodicals now that they are, they are off-site. Um, and uh, just to fill in a little context, um, just to make sure we're all, all on the same page, um, as, as most of you know, we have a one copy policy at the shared collection facility. So if a library sends a an issue of a journal to the storage um, facility and that, um, that issue already exists in the storage facility. It's been supplied by another library. Um, the, the library most recently sending that volume, that volume uh, would just be, that, that duplicate volume would be discarded, right? So the shared collection facility in theory holds um, one copy of each volume for each periodical that's in the share, that's in that governed by that one copy policy. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other copies at the other libraries um, on site, um, but it means in, in essence that a single run of a periodical, so from volume one to the present, um, if it's at the shared storage facility, shared collection facility, um, is technically owned, could be owned by multiple different libraries. For instance, you know, GW might have volumes one through 10 there and Georgetown might have volumes 11 through 20 and AU might have 21 through 30. Um, so that's, that's the first point to keep in mind through the next few slides. The other is um, with the new architecture that um, Don referred to, the, uh, this, this architecture solved a lot of problems, but in, in some ways it exacerbated the problem. Um, for, for users for discovery and access of these periodicals governed by the one copy policy um, insofar as now the holdings at the SCF uh, are reflected um, as belonging to the owning IZ. So there's no longer, um, when we look at this, uh, for instance, we look at this periodical in Primo, there's no longer going to be share collection facility as its own institution zone, as its own library. You will only see the other, you know, the individual IZs and their offsite storage locations. So on the screen here, you can see um, this is uh, GW's holdings or availability for, for Granta. Um, and the first one there that says offsite storage periodicals, that's, that represents GW's holdings of this periodical in the shared collection facility. Um, the other two there are uh, stacks copies um, and part of this, which is we're not really addressing with this project, but part of the challenge is also um, inconsistent metadata for periodicals and holdings that may in many cases be out of date. So 
uh, the check for item availability, the unavailable there, that probably reflects issues with um, you know, holdings that may not actually have any items in them. Uh, but we'll ignore that for the moment and just focus on the fact that, okay, so this, this periodical is, appears to be available in the offsite storage um, for a GW patron. So um, Aaron, you can go to the next slide there. So once you expand that offsite storage location um, in Primo, what you get is, in this case, uh, a list of items. And you also get, as I mentioned, uh, there are multiple routes to obtain the item that you're looking for. So there, there are Primo provides two, or Alma, I should say, provides two avenues to request multi-volume works. Um, one is called, uh, and this is this is at the level at which a patron would be requesting something owned by their own institution. So the first uh, up at the top there in red, the title level direct request. If you clicked that, which um, is called request other issue by default, um, you'd get a form that had space allowing the user to like enter um, a volume, an issue, um, a year, et cetera, page numbers. Um, and that goes into the system as a title level direct request. The other option is to place an item level direct request. So as you can see down at the bottom, from this list of items, uh, the user could click on what we've, we've renamed the label borrow item, but it's, it's really that uh, hold, direct hold request at the item level. So if you clicked on borrow item for, for number one there, it would actually place a request on the specific item uh, for issue one of the Granta, which in our case is at the shared collection facility. Um, and the, uh, the SCF architecture, the new architecture um, has in place a process that will route that request to the SCF and it could be fulfilled. So from, from a sort of staff processing side, the optimal situation is that the, the user is creating a, a item level request because then that's tied to a specific barcode and the SCF staff know, you know immediately which item to fetch from the shelves and process um, and send to the user's institution for them to, for them to use. Um, okay, I think we can go to the next slide here. Um, so this is this is what happens with, um, or this can happen with uh, with many periodicals, right? There's going to be a long list of items, so that's one of the that's one aspect of this challenge, right? Uh, if the if the journal has like thirty or fifty volumes to make a to make an item level request, the user would have to scroll down potentially a very long list. Um, to find the one they want. Now they could place the title level request um, that would also get routed to the, the IZ. Um, so you might say, well, why don't we just use that and not have the users request a specific item? Well, that takes us to the third sort of leg of this uh, challenge. So we can go to the next screen. So let's assume in this case that the particular um, volume of Granta we were looking for uh, was not actually owned by GW. So the user would see what we saw on the previous screen. They would see that long list of items. They would see the ability to place a title level request. But if they happen to go through the list of items, they might find that, oh, actually, this particular volume isn't owned by GW um, in the sense that it's not you know, it, it's not at the, the copy that's at the shared collection facility is not GW's copy. So then they would have to go back to a previous screen and look at the other, at the sort of network zone level availability. So in this case, um, this is for Georgetown's lounger library. Um, you know, if they clicked on that, then they would see the list of items um, owned by Georgetown, uh, which also may or may not be at the shared collection facility. Now, to access these items, they cannot currently place either 
a direct item request or a title level direct request, they have to use a resource sharing request. Um, so to kind of go back to what you know Don started with, um, in Voyager, we had, um, at least for all the schools that use the shared Voyager catalog, we had a single request form. In, in Alma Primo, we actually have three request forms. Uh, there's the resource sharing request, which is for items that are not able to be supplied by your own institution. And then we have, in the case of multi-volume works, both this item level request and this title level request. So there's no way in the current architecture to provide a single route for all kinds of all these different possibilities. Um, and you know, we've we've also talked with Ex Libris about the desirability of you know including the patron's home institution as part of the resource sharing rota. Um, so that you know patrons would just collect, submit a resource sharing request for anything and their own institution would pop up first and if that wasn't able to fulfill it then it would move on to the next one um and ex libris has told us that's not that's not on their roadmap at least for the immediate future um the other issue here is that this um are really the kind of the the structural issue behind this situation is that um the network zone availability is not loaded into primo when the institution zone availability is loaded so there is a kind of it's a performance issue in the sense that you know when you go back when you click on gw you look at the items you don't see the one you're looking for you go back a screen you click on georgetown then it has to load that availability at that time so when you go to the you know initial screen that shows you the availability for say granta at that point, Primo doesn't actually know all of the availability through the consortium or across the network. If it did, presumably that would make it easier to kind of at that point present the user with a unified list of options um, so they could choose the best one or that it could kind of guide them to the best option. Um, but that that isn't currently how the architecture works. So it's putting a lot of burden on the user to interpret these results and decide what the best um, kind of request to places for the item. Um, and if they place the wrong request, you know, um, obviously resource sharing staff or, you know, try to be as helpful as they can, but requests, you know, get canceled, patrons get frustrated, they don't know why they can't request something that seems like it's available. Um, it's not always clear to them what their options are in terms of moving on from that cancellation. Um, so these are all the sorts of things that we are, we are trying to, uh, we're, we're exploring how to solve for in this project. Um, and and the, the challenge of the project is, is there a way to automate this process behind the scenes so that the user doesn't have to make the decision as to which kind of request to place? They can simply say, I want, I want this item. Here's all the information I know about it. You know, maybe I know the volume number, I know the year, and then the system would a system that we build would determine which which item in the network can match, meet this request, if any, and then direct the user's request to the appropriate destination. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm just going to talk about one piece of this, and then uh, Don will talk about a couple other pieces. Um, so one of the one of the technical challenges here um, is moving from the user's request for a specific volume in a multi-volume work uh, periodical uh, to the matching item. Um, so as, as we saw a couple of screens previous, in Primo, they, they can do that technically in the UI if they are willing to look through a long list and then select the one with the, um, you know, select the item level request corresponding to that item. Um, but we were looking at ways to to automate that matching process, um, and it it turns out we can use the um, item description field in the item record. Um, and one of the challenges of using this field, however, is that it it's not a it's not a mark field, so this isn't part of the mark record. Um, so it's not um, 
you know, in, in Mark records uh, are structured to kind of separate labels and their values. So you can clearly identify, you know, what, what kind of label is associated with what value. Um, in the item description field, the labels and values are just part of one long string. So the technical challenge was, can we parse this um, and extract, for instance, from the first example here, that this is, refers to the range between volume for 114, number 1152, and number 1162 in the same volume. And that there's this, you know, that range is also inclusive of the months between February and December of the year 2010. So um, we've made some progress here in the pilot. Um, and the one, the things you're seeing on the left, which are largely, these, these are all examples from GW, um, but uh, currently um, we have a script that can parse all of these kinds of variations pretty successfully. Um, and the good news is that uh, some sampling we did in the consortium, um, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of outliers, you know, that have other kinds of elements in the description field, but the the majority, and for GW and AU, it seems like the vast majority um, conform to these more or less kind of canonical examples where you have your four basic elements, volume, year, and to a lesser extent, issue and month. Um, there are other elements, again, in the outliers like appendices and index and so forth, but but that's a, a minority of the cases. Um, so we think that if we could successfully parse these um, sort of more standard cases, that would account for probably most of the requests that users would make. Um, one roadblock we haven't addressed yet is that uh, at least Georgetown's descriptions follow a very different pattern from what I've shown here. Um, and it's not to say that that pattern couldn't be parsed, but it, it can't be parsed by the same logic that would work for GW, AU, and presumably um, the other schools that come from the shared Voyager catalog. And I think I'm turning it over to Don at this point. Um. So we, we didn't get a chance to go in um, very much detail in terms of designing the user experience in this investigation. Um, but we have demonstrated that with a general electronic service and display logic rules, we can limit the request options uh, that are presented to the user compared to, to what uh, Dulce's screenshot was showing, for example. Um, and we've also demonstrated that we can get some sort of minimal information from Primo um, about the request to initiate the um, the searching for an item that that um, Dulce was was describing um, via the descriptions. Um, we can get an ISSN and so that would allow us to identify the title. Uh, we can get the user ID um, we, we haven't actually tested this, but it's used commonly, it's a mechanism that's used commonly uh, for um, ILL requests, where you are actually putting the general electronic service uh, through your proxy server, which is authenticated um, with uh, the same way that, that uh, the user is authenticated for, for Primo, and uh, usually has a, a single sign on there and also um, is configured to put the user ID in a um, um, HTTP request header. So we think, uh, we think we can use the same mechanism for that. And we can also get um, the IZ that the request comes from, uh, which would allow us to get more information about that, that user. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> Since the link is at this title or, or bib level, the users are the ones going to need to describe uh, the specific item that they want. Uh, so, Aaron, the next slide. 
And this uh, presents a, a number of questions that, again, we haven't had time to, to look at um, from a user experience standpoint. Um, we need to try to uh, direct the user to enter data that can be um, read by parsing uh, routines. So they need to enter some semi-structured data for things like numbers, uh, years, months. Um, we can use uh, drop-down menus uh, for months, for example, uh, and we can use controls in the form for um, the types of characters that can be entered and the length. Uh, so for example, force the year to be exactly a four digit year. But we can't require all the fields to be filled in because uh, the user may not know all of those uh, fields. Um, and this presents a, a problem, for example, if, um, if the user wants to enter, knows the year and month of the issue that they want, but the description on the item is going to have the volume and, and the year on it. Um, but the goal, uh, and, and we would have to do some more, more work on this, but the, the goal is to make it as easy as possible for the user uh, while getting the sort of the best quality description we can to, to have a, a decent hit rate of, of um, being able to identify the items by the parsed description. Uh, the next one, Aaron. Um, but clearly, we're, you know, that's not going to be 100% um, effective, and it's not even going to be as, as effective as um, our uh, testing of, of parsing uh, has been uh, because of the issue with the, with the user data. So we need to have some kind of fallback uh, if we can't find the item. And this is where we can do um, what, what uh, Dulce was showing you in the Primo uh, request other issue link is, is a title level request. Uh, so this is a request that doesn't have an item and its barcode um, assigned to it. Um, but, and we can create these through the Alma APIs. Um, so the basic form processing that we've tested is to, um, well, first say that, that the Alma APIs require a bib ID, what, what we used to call a bib ID and they call an MMS ID uh, to get the holdings for a title. Um, and of course, as you saw from my general electronic service configuration, we can't get that um, from, from the GES. Uh, so we use uh, SRU to search the holdings uh, for, um, for an ISSN. And then we can get through the Alma APIs, um, all the items for each uh, holdings record um, that, that we find through the SRU search. Um, and then the processing of the form would be, uh, you know, if we can identify the requested item uh, from a, a parsed uh, item description, great, we're, we're done. And we place the item uh, level request for the user. Otherwise we create this title level request. And then it's up to fulfillment and resource sharing staff to identify uh, the item uh, to fill it. And uh, Liam has taken a look at um, how the staff might do that. And so I'll hand it over to him now. Uh, thanks, Don. So yeah, I think part of the benefit of this process for staff is that the workflow is going to be largely similar to what people are doing now. Uh, so once it's been turned into a request in the IZ, it's no different than any other request that's being processed. Um, however, there's a greater likelihood of things that I think we would currently call edge cases. In most requests, you have barcodes. In most requests, you're doing item level filling and this kind of uh, exaggerates the number of those that would be dealt with. So just to walk briefly through the process that we'd be conceiving it for staff, um, 
if it comes in with an item um, already identified, so it's an item level request, uh, there's a barcode, you know exactly what you're looking for, then you could go up and grab that. And ideally, it would be the one that the user actually wants. In the case of a title level request, I think this would be a case where more attention would need to be paid by staff as they're going upstairs. Uh, however, we could take advantage of the same manual description that we've been talking about through this and put it on the pick slip. Uh, I'm showing an example of that there. I, it's, at least at AU, it is not on our slip now. I'm assuming it's not at most other institutions. So this would be something that we would need to add on. Uh, and I think this also highlights um, one of the benefits of using actual people to do this, since while it would be extremely hard to, it's extremely hard to parse this um, with a computer to look for exactly what the volumes are. Someone actually standing on the stacks could very easily determine which one of the um, which one of the volumes actually has 2017 volume 25. So once they get that volume and bring it back downstairs, uh, then at that point we'd be processing a title level request. And Aaron, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So there's two different ways to do this that we're walking through here. Uh, the first one is without a request ID. So every request has a request ID. Normally, though, you don't need to use that when you're processing requests because you just scan the item barcode into the scan in screen, and it knows that there's a request on it. Um, and the other one is uh, so with and without the request ID. So in the first one, without the request ID, you would start just as you normally would. You scan in the item barcode. Um, that little rectangle there is cut out of the scan and item screen. And once you do that, you'll see the pop-up message that is on the right hand of number two, uh, saying that existing holding requests may be fulfillable uh, by the scanned in item. So Alma's letting you know that there is a request at the title level out there, and they notice that the thing that you just scanned in might be able to fill that request. So still on that same screen, number three now under without request ID. Still on that same screen, go to the line where the item was just scanned in, and you'll see an option there that is not um, usually needed for requests called attach to request. And when you click on that, you'll get a pop-up. We're on number four now. And it lets you pick uh, which request you're trying to fill. Again, you see the manual description there. Now it's possible, although probably unlikely given the number uh, of requests that we get for full volumes, but certainly possible that you could see multiple requests on this same screen that would be filled. Uh, so I guess I'm thinking here, if a researcher is requesting eight volumes of the same title because they need 24 issues, you would then see eight things lined up there potentially. And you would then need to pay attention to which manual description you're picking, but you select that and then fill it and then down on number five, you'll see that it's been put on hold shelf just the same as it would be for any other item. The other way to do that is with the request ID. So now we're over on the right hand side, uh, B. The request ID, the difficulty of this, I think it's more precise, but the difficulty is that it's hard to actually have the request ID because we don't usually use it. You can find it in the monitor requests and item processes field. And also uh, I, I would suggest that if we did this, we might want to add it back into the pull slips. Uh, again, at American University, they are not there now. I think they actually are in the default out of the box Alma slip. But if you have the request ID and you put it into that second field under the barcode, uh, then when you scan it, it immediately attaches this to the request. You don't have to worry about identifying things, looking through lists, dealing with pop-ups, extra steps, et cetera. The other thing that is currently, again, more of an edge case that will come up in this process are items without barcodes, either without barcodes in the book or without barcodes in the record. Uh, again, I can only speak for American, but I know that for bound issues, uh, that would be one of the probably the highest percentage of items we have where there wasn't a barcode added in, um, in many cases, because we didn't used to circulate these at all. Uh, so if there is no barcode, um, then you probably will need to add it to the item uh, before you're able to scan it. And uh, there's a special challenge for staff who are working at the shared collection facility, since they will need to find the item based on the manual description in Alma, um, 
without having the benefit of a barcode. And so they'll actually need to look it up in an item list. Um, and this, again, I think is certainly something that happens now. It's just not as frequently as it would probably occur if we were using this process. So opening one of those lists in Alma, looking at the potentially hundreds of volumes that are there, but then filtering perhaps based on year from the drop downs that you have at the top of the item list. And then you'd be able to find the item, open it up, find the uh, bin number, and then pull the issue to send it off. So yeah, in, in essence, I think this is pretty similar to the process we have now. It just kind of adds extra layers of complication that right now we see pretty infrequently. Um, and I think, I'm sorry, I actually don't remember if uh, Don, back to you or is Dulce next? Um, it's back to me. And um, I have here uh, a summary of things that we uh, are still thinking we want to look into. But um, I'm not going to spend time on this. What I want is questions uh, and discussion. And I, I think um, I should have said this at the beginning. But uh, if you please submit uh, your questions to the chat, then, then Aaron will, will read them out to us. Um, and I'll just go through this to, to take up time while we wait for things to come in from the chat. Um, and Aaron, just interrupt me. Uh, when you get something that we can discuss. We're particularly interested in finding out whether what you think is, you know, would be useful going forward, whether you would consider uh, using a, a form like this for all or, or some part of your, of your um, uh, user experience. Um, but, but, but there are some things that uh, we, we still need to look into more. Um, I mentioned the, the user experience, and so getting the, the user-friendly form design um, that will produce a decent item search uh, hit rate. Um, we also, our form processing testing has not really explored yet searching for title and titles and items in, um, in other IZs um, besides the, the user's you know, home IZ. Um, we know how to, to do this, to do the searching with SRU and Alma APIs, but we haven't tested it. And more importantly, we haven't designed any kind of mechanism to go through the IZs in a uh, ROTA kind of way. Um, it doesn't appear there'd be a way to create a resource sharing request with the APIs and then let Alma create the ROTA and get it into our automated fulfillment network, but we need to look into that option uh, further as well. Um, but if we don't have, we can't create um, AFN requests, then we need some way to handle requests that uh, in going through the process that Liam described, uh, staff can't fill. They can't find an item to fill it. Um, we can try converting those requests to resource sharing requests in the, um, in the Alma back end. But um, that's kind of hard to test in the sandbox and it, it doesn't always work uh, in production we've found. Um, we could also, uh, and this might be the simplest for staff, if, we, if they just canceled the request and then we'd have the custom form application catch a webhook and, and uh, sort of manage its own rota through that mechanism. Um, and, and again, if we're going through this too fast or too briefly and you have any questions about uh, what we've been describing or why we've been doing what we've been doing, uh, just just put those in the chat. We only have about five minutes left, Don. So we might, if, we, if we have any questions, we might wanna uh, start moving in that direction. Well, that's what I was trying to encourage people to do, oh. but I, you know, I can't stand dead air. So I was gonna go ahead and continue on this slide till we got one. Did we seed any questions with the other members of the team? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, uh, good. Uh, Dulce, how did you, how were you able to determine that 93% of George GW records had the four necessary elements? Uh, sure. So um, I was using a sample of about 80,000 items from one, from our main periodical uh, SCF location. So it wasn't all of our multi-volume works or periodicals, but but probably the majority of them. Um, and what I did was sort of run run the parsing script against all of them. And from the results was able to sort of determine that 
did not have any other elements um, other than volume issue year and month. So they don't, the 93% don't all have those four. It's just they, they're, I was trying to determine how many outliers would, would the current um, algorithm not catch. And that's, a, that's, for example, things like where it says like 32nd edition or something that I'm considering not one of those four elements. Right. Does that help? Yes. So Shen Yun also has put in a question from Catholic University. She says, will the user see the status of the request in his or her My Library account? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, th they'll see it in their My Library account. Um, and, and basically, they'll get all of, for requests that are made through APIs, they'll get all of the email communications and, and uh, My Library account stuff that they would get with the requests they place uh, directly in Primo. Um, but, and this goes to the last bullet item here, um, Dulce had this idea of how we could uh, pre-populate using publishing jobs and database that would have and pre-parse these item descriptions uh, so that we would be able to search all across the network for uh, owners of the title and what items they had, um, possibly in real time. And that would mean that not only would they see it in their my library uh, account, my account thing, that we might be able, also able to respond with not just your um, request was successfully submitted, but whether your request is pending at a particular uh, IZ uh, right there on the form uh, after they clicked it, you know, within um, a second or two. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a dream, that part of it, but um, it, it might well be possible. Thanks, Don. Uh, another question coming in is, um, what does maintenance on this single request option look like if it's adopted? Uh, how easily can this be disrupted by Ex Libris monthly releases? Thank you. And that comes from Shane Hickey at American University. Uh, that's a good question. And I, I don't know that I could give a definitive answer or if anybody else on the team can. But I think um, Using the APIs uh, is something that a lot of people do for a lot of things, and Ex Libris has made an effort uh, to keep that um, uh, compatible, you know, from release to release. Uh, so if they break something uh, that you're depending on in the APIs, that is a regression, and they would address it as such. Um, but the hope is that it would be less vulnerable to uh, changes in functionality than the kinds of um, configurations that we do with with um, display logic rules and, and GES configurations. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, Glenn from Glenn Canner from GW asks, could this possibly also be used to request microfilm feet or microfiche from the SCF? Um, can you answer that, Aaron? Um, Aaron, um, do, you, do you, I mean, I, I don't see why not, but I don't know all of, um, you know, what might be different about uh, those, that media in the SCF. This is- Yeah, I mean, I would- Oh, sorry. I would say they, they are multi-volume works. Um, you know, I'm not sure um, what this, you know, how they are cataloged necessarily. Um, and and, and what, what the item description fields might look like for those, but uh, Kathy, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just saying um, the process would be very similar to uh, move requests, I believe. Um, but this this also speaks to you know our questions about um, if you could just go to the last slide real quick, uh, Aaron. Um, our, our questions about where are there opportunities for taking advantage of this um, of this work. Uh, and, and if that's a, a case that has pain points 
uh, it may be something to, to look into. And especially if it's, if it's a, a, a request um, use case that is more common than, than um, uh, a single volume of a periodical physical item request. So um, I think we're out of time, um, but I would, um, I would like to get um, feedback from you all offline if this is some a discussion that you'd like to continue uh, in terms of what we recommend or what we decide to do for the next year uh, and what might be a good uh, forum uh, for continuing this discussion if, if indeed um, there's interest. Um, so, so thank you to, to um, the whole team um, and, and to everybody who's, who was able to, to join us today.